Welcome back, Beans Army, to another episode of the Less Is More Sports Podcast. Before we get started on our episode today, I do want to talk about some local recruitments that I want to congratulate. Uh, first one is Caden Magwood, a four-star combo guard from Louisville, Kentucky, playing for Combine Academy, who has committed to Auburn. So congratulations to Caden. The second one is Leah Macy, who is a five-star forward from E-Town, Kentucky, playing for Bethlehem High School, who verbaled to Notre Dame. So congratulations to Caden and, and Leah Macy for their commitments earlier this week. But as for the main topic today, Ryan and I are just going to talk about some early college hoops action, um, maybe a little bit of overreactions, thoughts on what we've seen so far in the college basketball season. So, Ryan, I've done enough talking. Where do you want to start, bud? Um, I would like to ask you a question about your Duke Blue Devils. I probably that, have an answer. That did play on Tuesday, and it's it's kind of a two in one question. So, what did Duke learn from the Kentucky game? What did they learn? I mean, quite yeah. a bit. Um, you got to fix the little things. That's the number one lesson that I think that they learned. You can't go one of 11 on open jump shots in the second half and expect to beat a good team like Kentucky. Um, their training staff is ironically the one who has the biggest lesson right now, because in our first two games of the year, Cooper flag has been dealing with cramp issues in the Kentucky game. Come on. Malowich, uh, was dealing with cramp issues, which that really changed the game in the second half. If you That's watch crushing. the, yeah, for sure. And come on, Malowich in the first half, Kentucky wasn't getting a shot within eight foot of the rim. When he goes down with cramps, Kentucky's able to get easy shots of the rim. They're able to develop some kind of rhythm. And then that's where they outscored Duke 40 to 26 in the second half. Um, and then, of course, Sion James goes out with the injury. That doesn't help as well. That's not a cramp issue, but still an injury nonetheless. I do think the Sion James injury will be better in the long run. Don't don't get me wrong here, because I want Sion James to be OK. He's going to be a big part of the team. But for him missing potentially the next couple games, that's going to pave the way for guys like Darren Harris, for Isaiah Evans, Pat and Gamba to be able to come in, get some much needed minutes, kind of get the reps that they need to develop in the college game. And then later on down the road, Duke can be that deep team that I thought they would be. Um, overall, as far as the game goes, was not concerned with anything I saw from Duke. I, there was nothing at no point did I watch them and think, oh, that's a problem that needs to be fixed and fixed now, or that's going to cost them down the road. No, they. this was, you know, a young team. Actually, I want to be careful how I say that. They do have some experience, but they also have a lot of young young guys on Gillis. top of that. Do what? Gillis. He's experienced. Yeah, Gillis, Proctor, Foster, um, yeah. Malik Brown, Sion James, all experienced guys. But – the three most important players on this Duke team are all freshmen, and I think they had a freshman learning uh, moment in their game against Kentucky. So overall, I think more good comes out of this game than bad. Not worried at all about Duke. And we rebound here in a little bit against Wofford, so we'll see. Yeah. I was So you kind of answered my second question. My second question was, what did you learn from your Duke Blue Devils against Kentucky? My only thing, I guess, to add on to that – so I don't repeat myself. I do think that Duke is more reliant than I would like them to be on three-point line. Coming into the season, one thing that stood out is that we don't have a guy who plays regular minutes under 6'5". So I thought we could be able to beat a lot of teams with our pressure defense, being able to get out, fast break, get to the rim, et cetera. But what I've noticed early on in the season is that they've kind of lived and died by the three-point line more than I would like them to. This Duke team is a very capable shooting team. Um, we have plenty of guys that are more than capable of shooting over 40% from three. The problem is, is that as much as they can shoot any team out of the out of the gym, they can also shoot themselves out of a game. And I think we saw a lot of that in the game against Kentucky. Yeah, I, I understand that for sure. And, you know, it, it, as a non I, I wanted Kentucky to lose because I don't like Kentucky. But I felt like maybe Cooper Flag was kind of dribbling too much on the last possession, and maybe they needed to set something up, and that l led to turnovers, which sucks. Obviously, he played well. He had 26 points. So he I don't think he was the problem maybe until dribbling too much at the end. But, but yeah, I, I saw Malawar kept getting – Kept getting injured. It looked like his knee or something. Maybe it was cramps. It was just cramps. 
It was, yeah. yeah. That block from him was absolutely. I mean, he looked like he looked like he caught the ball and threw it down. Like he could have caught it with both hands. No, I got a funny story about that block real quick. After that block, um, I joked with my girlfriend Elizabeth and said, "If you and me ever played one on one in basketball, that's how bad I would block you." Yeah, that was that was nuts. That was nuts. No, nah, he's going to be – Malawatch is going to be, or as we like to call him, man-man, um, he's going to be a big part of our success going forward. I mean, the more he develops – he's still a very raw player, no ditty. But he's – um, you, you can look at me like that all you want, but it's the truth. I mean, from a technical term, he is a very raw big. And Is he like, is he like Daddy Shaq? It, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not going there. Since you, since you said Daddy Shaq. Uh, technically, if we think about it, you have – Two Olympic players on your team. I mean, Cooper Flag didn't play for the Olympic team, but he played against them. He played the for the select Olympics. team. The so, he he yeah. played for the select team. Yeah, close enough. So, only college player that was invited to play for the select team. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, play, playing alongside some some uh, some young guys in there. I just love though how the rest of college basketball learned what I've known for the last four years. And that's that Cooper flag is legit. It's like, no, he's, this isn't a guy who's just been getting all this hype for no reason. Like he is the real deal. Like Kentucky fans were so mad whenever the game ended and like the first graphic design is do not get me started on that. <laughs> no, um, I actually, I was listening to that. Um, but at, what's it called on Twitter? The Twitter space. Yeah, yeah. I was listening to that, and I knew you were in that. And, I mean, there was one guy. Oh, he had, like, the profile picture of, like, it looked like a kind of like a truck. He was just going off. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, I don't think that guy knows much about basketball. I'm going to be completely honest. It was hilarious because I Barstool, Kentucky was in there also. But I was just waiting for you to talk. And I heard you sometimes, but mm -hmm. it was funny. I listened to it for a little bit. And I always like to listen to the – 93-9 show, like, post-game whenever Kentucky loses. It's, I mean, it's it's like a joy for Louisville fans. Yeah, that was the only bad part about this game for me is that Kentucky won, is that we had to get our first loss against Kentucky. And that's more of a me thing than it is a Duke thing. So, I overall was not worried at all. That nothing concerned me about that loss. Much as I hated it, I, I was impressed by them and Mark Pope and what he's done. Oh, absolutely. He's done a phenomenal job in such a short period of time. And, you know, I can't give him enough credit for that. And I can't give the players enough credit for buying in as quickly as they did. So hats off to Kentucky. They look like a really well-balanced unit, which actually is going to lead me into the first question I have for you. As good as Kentucky looked against Duke at times, do you think this is the best it gets for them? Or do you think they can reach another level? Honestly, I, w I kept thinking about this question, and it'll obviously change because we still have a couple months, and obviously March Madness. I think that they could go to another level. I just don't know how they will because could, they could go to another level, and it'll be one of those like Saturday games against like Tennessee, like one of the SEC opponents where they just look really, really good, but they could also – have a game where they just struggle and they lose to a bad team and everyone makes fun of them, which is hilarious. But I, I think I don't think this this is the best we'll see from them. But it was one of the best. And honestly, like I, I watched the whole game. I watched the end of the Kansas the Kansas uh, Michigan State game into the Kentucky Duke game, and they looked. I mean, they had moments where they couldn't hit many shots. They were down at halftime, obviously came back, but I think that they could go to another level. I just don't know if that level will be during March Madness because we have no clue what's going to happen with them. When if We could take an educated guess with Cal and be like, um, no matter who they play in the first round, they're going to lose, but this is different. This is Mark Pope. This is a whole different team. Who knows? They, I mean, they have a really – experience roster i mean they said what they say duke's oldest player was younger than kentucky's, kentucky's player. Like youngest player that's yeah. nuts yeah like the, of the guys that play yeah because you know you still got the yeah. freshman yeah you got travis perry who's obviously a freshman so yeah but as far so as they, our sense. oldest player is younger than their youngest start uh guy who plays but 
I actually, I'm going to actually go the other way on this. You know, Jay, uh, Jason Williams got a lot of heat for this from Kentucky fans on Twitter, but I actually agree with him. I think Kentucky does peak from for to a certain extent. Don't get me wrong. I, I get there are a lot of new guys that haven't played a lot together. And from that standpoint, I do think they'll maybe tighten up the little things and develop better chemistry as the se- as the season goes on. But at the end of the day, I think as far as what Kentucky is going to look like, I mean, they're not going to look much differently than they are now. I mean, they might tighten up a couple turnovers here and there, might be, develop a little bit better chemistry, but this is what this is kind of who they are. And I don't see them adding another like element to their game as the season goes on. I mean, how you beat this Kentucky team now is how you're going to beat them later on in the season. It'd be different if they had some younger guys that are still like adjusting to the college game. But of the guys that play, I mean, we know what they are. We know what Amari Williams is. We know what Kirk Kreese is. We know what Lamont Butler is. We know what Kobe Bure is. And how, and like I said, how you can beat them now is how you're going to be able to beat them later on in the season. So, no, I think Kentucky has peaked. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because they are still a very good contending team and maybe even a little better than I thought they were. But again, I don't see them adding another element to their game that later on the season that they don't have right now. You see Kirk Greese is trying to, I don't know if it was trying to, trying to beef with Sion James. Sion James is built like an absolute linebacker. Sion James would lay his ass out. Let's not even go there. I, I, okay. Uh, what I will, I I, before Kirk we move on, before we move on, I'm going to say this about Kirk Kreese. He tried to backtrack after the game because before the, they played against Duke, he tried to throw a little sarcastic comment. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Cooper flags, apparently the number one overall pick already. Uh, congrats to him. And then he tried to like backtrack and be like, I don't know why y'all got so mad about it. I said he was the number one pick. It's like, no, you know what you did. Don't do that. It's like the whole thing about why people were upset with what Nick Bosa did in the in the post game with Brock Purdy. It's not that you know he made the statement; it's that he didn't stand on business. Like if you have a belief, stand on business, stick to your guns. I mean, what do you what are you doing, man? You know what you did. Own up to it. Don't try to play. Don't try to weasel out of it. No, Kirk Kreese. If Kirk Kreese played for Duke, he would be unanimously the most hated player in America, and I stand by that. I I agree, and he's gonna be. One of them, probably the most hated players by me. Uh, but it, and it's it, it's even worse that it's on Kentucky also. But he shot like what, like two, two and nine, two and nine. Yeah, he shot two and nine and was like the loudest player on the court. Like, dude, come on now. Yeah, and, and then they had that one Kentucky podcast that was talking about him being like the most electrifying player in college basketball. Like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> He's not even the best guard on Kentucky, but he's the most electrifying player in college basketball. I get that's from a personality standpoint, but dude, low key almost cost Kentucky the game too. Let's not forget about that. Yeah, um, this is besides the point, but I didn't realize till like half the game that uh, he his like his last name or his first name is on the back of his jersey. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that until halfway through the game, but. Anyway, anything is, I think we've spent a little too much time talking about the Duke and Kentucky game because we have more teams that we got to talk about in this 40 minute episode. And since you asked me about one of my teams, I'm going to ask you now about both of yours. What do you think about U of L and Ohio State so far? Louisville, I think they just need to find their identity. It was a very tough game against Tennessee, and Tennessee is a very good team. They have a, a lot of experienced players, especially with Zakai Ziegler when he hit like a logo shot and knew it was over because. If you hit those type of shots, you're going to win. You're going to win the game. But obviously, one of the bigger steps was the crowd showing up. That was huge. That was huge having a whiteout. Obviously, we didn't play how we wanted to. We just have to find the identity and find who our players are that are going to score. I, I like a couple of players. Like, I like Casey Pryor, but I just I don't know. And the one of the problems I have with Louisville with watching the Kentucky Duke game is that we really don't have any bigs that are big and physical and just stay down low. We have bigs that want to expand the game and shoot threes, and that is basketball now. That That's mainly basketball now, but it just doesn't feel like we have the physicality, and we can obviously get that from Pat Kelsey by recruiting and transfers, but it, it, I feel like we lack that, but we need to find who our 
scorer is on offense, and we have to have better defense. But we just have to win the games that we're supposed to win. And I'm not, I wasn't expecting a lot coming into the season from Louisville. I hope we have a couple, like at least beat like two or three ranked teams. That that'd be cool. But who knows? We play Indiana. But so we play Bellarmine Tuesday. We play Indiana eventually, and um, maybe battle for Atlantis, maybe. But now to Ohio State. I really like Ohio State's team. It was a tough loss last night against Texas A&M, but Texas A&M's always tough, and they always have a crowd for no matter what sport it is. It could be lacrosse. And there'd be, I mean, they would have the stands packed. And Wade Taylor always, always does well against us, but. I like our team. We're pretty experienced. I think that maybe one of the flaws would be the big man, like center. Like, Sean Stewart's good. I like him on the defensive side. I just don't know about a lot of offense with him. And so is Aaron Bradshaw. But I like our guards a lot. We have a lot of three-point shooting, especially with John Mobley Jr., who I love. I mean, he, he made, like, three threes last night. I had, like, 13 points. He's a really good shooter. Michi Johnson, very experienced. Bruce Thornton, very experienced. We just have to get them going early in big games. And we have a couple we have a couple good games coming up. But we just we have to get back to the basics and we have to perform well. And we were kind of letting Texas AM's defense kind of destroy us and not be able to get in the paint. And the the arrows were just pointing to their side all of last night. It was a really tough game, but and not not a lot of score. I mean, the first half going into the second half, it wasn't a lot of scoring, but it will be. I think we'll be fine. We may be outside ranked, maybe like top in the twenties the whole year. And I hope we. The goal is to make the tournament, so I I feel better about Ohio State than Louisville. But I think Louisville, I think they're on the rise. Like who said it? So someone said it on the on the Duke Kentucky broadcast that Louisville was on on the way up. But yeah, that's just what I think about Ohio State and Louisville. I saw a missed opportunity there. You totally could have rubbed in the fact that Ohio State beat my Longhorns. And I thought about it, but should have like I would I wouldn't have been mad about it. They did. They came in. They shot us out of the building. And you know, credit to John Mobley Jr. Bro, bro's a sniper. Bro looked like <laughs> Steph Curry's son out there just shooting logo shots. But uh, no, y'all, Trey I mean, Johnson's yeah. a dog, but the, he just, I don't think he had much help in that game. I will say this about Trey Johnson. This might be my hot take for the show that I don't think Trey Johnson is the necessarily the best freshman uh, since Kevin Durant for Texas. I think he's the best player since Kevin Durant for Texas. So that might, may or may not be a hot take, all depending on who's listening. But who, when who I, do you we, think he's going against? That was going to be the question I asked. When you think of Texas basketball, do you really think of a player that really stands out post Kevin Durant? Because, I mean, I can name a bunch of good players, but I can't. It's hard to think of that one it guy. I don't really know. I don't, I don't really I don't know a lot. I know some I know a lot of big men that have came from Texas because it, it seems like that's a popular. A popular thing to do is like. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't nearly the best, I don't think, but uh what's his name for the Cavs? Jared Allen. Jared Allen. I mean, that's that's a big man that came from Texas. But yeah, I would agree. I think he's now I don't know a lot of players, but I think he could be the best since Kevin Durant. And so far he's he's balling, so Nah, he's a bucket. He is a bucket. Um, moving on because we kind of flying through this episode real quick. Um, while we're talking about some early season overreactions, I was listening to the field of 68 and they seem to believe that at this point in time, Gonzaga is the best team in America. So would you agree or disagree with that statement? I'm going to actually disagree. I think they're one of the best. I know they barely beat Bobby Hurley's team in Arizona state. But I think that there are other teams. They're definitely Gonzaga's definitely up there. They play really well against teams, uh, a team like Baylor, who who's good and experienced. But I'm gonna 
I think Kansas is up there too with being the best. I don't like Hunter Dickinson at all, but whatever. There, Kansas is really good. I feel like Auburn could be up there if they don't kill each other on the plane, <laughs> like fighting each other. I mean, you got to make it through this season. Come on now. But I, everyone saw that clip of the one guy. I forgot his name. Ja'Kai Howard. Yeah, who was just reacting to all of the threes. OTE's finest. <laughs> but, but yes, I'm going to. I'm going to say no. I don't think they're the best team, but they're definitely up there. Could be Kansas, could be Auburn. Um, trying to think. I mean, now Purdue's up there. I would have said Alabama, but playing at Purdue is tough. But I think I still think Alabama's good. A- Alabama seems to have the same problem they did last year towards the beginning of the season, and is that, th- that they live and die too much by the three-point shot. They weren't hitting the threes at the clip that they like to hit. But I I do think, you know, as the season went on last year, as they developed, you know, chemistry, and I think with a lot of new guys, not necessarily a lot of young guys, but a lot of new guys. Well, actually, yeah, kind of a couple of young guys, which I do want to throw out there that I was super high on LeBaron Phylon when he was coming out of the high school ranks, and he is just proving to be an absolute dog. So shout out to me on that one. But yeah, I think Alabama, as the season goes on, they'll do what they did last year, and they'll find other ways to win games other outside of hitting threes. But as of right now, they're still relying too much on the three-point shot. I'm actually going to disagree and say that at this point in time, I do think Gonzaga has been the most impressive team because they do have that absolute ass-kicking over Baylor. Now, we'll say this about Baylor. Um, they have a great backcourt, but they're not deep. They don't have a front ca- front court at all. I mean, Norchad Omier is they're going to be their starting five. Against a team with size, that could pose them a lot of problems as the season goes on, but... For Gonzaga to beat them like that, that was pretty impressive. So, so far, I think Gonzaga has been the most impressive team. I do think there will be teams as the season goes on that will pass them up as they kind of find their footing. But as of right now, I think Gonzaga has been the most impressive team. I'm going to be honest, I'm not impressed with Kansas at all. You know, I wasn't impressed with them last year. And then I gave them a lot of love in the offseason because they went out and got some high key transfers. Um, They landed some decent recruits, et cetera. And as of right now, what we've seen from them, they're very stagnant on offense. When Hunter Dickinson and KJ Adams are on the field together, there's like little to no spacing, which is weird because Hunter Dickinson can shoot. So why don't they draw up more plays to where he flashes out to the three point line? Um, If he's not even going to shoot, maybe set up a pat, maybe shoot up like a high post passer to hit KJ Adams cutting to the rim. But I still stand by what I said at the beginning of the season that for Kansas to reach their potential this year dickinson's gonna have to come off the bench be that spark plug off the bench i know that's hard to do with a guy that is on like every wooden watch list but that's the reality i think with this kansas team they need flory badunga to start be that rim running five um for them to take that next step and then just have hunter dickinson come off the bench and kind of do what he does but yeah overall i'm not impressed with kansas at all and speaking of teams i'm not impressed with arkansas I'm not impressed with them at all. New place, but it's the same old cow. The same old basic offensive sets. You know, if they can't get out and transition and run, they're kind of done right now. They don't shoot well. And honestly, if it weren't for Big Z and Fierro, I think they could be winless right now, if not for those two. Um, what was I going to say? Going back to Gonzaga, and this is funny. Um, it was kind of hilarious, and I felt bad for him when, what's his name, Mark F- Mark Few's son came in, and VJ Edscombe actually put his nuts on his forehead. <laughs> that was hilarious, and I felt Take bad. Take that, for him. Nepo baby. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was just, that was probably a frustration dunk for how bad, or how, how down they were against Baylor, or I mean, against Gonzaga, but oh my goodness. That was absolutely disgusting. Bean just told me Gonzaga's his favorite team this year. I can't imagine why. It's definitely because they have a dog as their logo, as their mascot. That that's Dusty Stroman. He tells me it's Graham Ek as his favorite player. That's what he tells me. That wow, that was rude. He just told me that Dusty Stromer looks like a d bag. Wasn't nice. Wow. Wow, Bean. Bean is rude when he wants to be. 
and he's very unapologetic about it, which I guess I do got to respect that. If you're going to be rude, at least be unapologetic about it. I don't know. I was going to say something about one of those topics. I don't know. Gonzaga's well, looked very, very good, and I don't, I don't really know who else they have to play, but they're going to, they're going to screw through their conference. Well, they do it every year. They play a tough non-conference, and then once conference play uh, comes, they play several weeks without playing like a really legitimate team, and I think that's what hurts them come the tournament. It's not that they're not battle tested, but they go so long not playing somebody, so that's I think what kills them at the in the long run. And I honestly don't know how good St. Mary's is, but St. Mary's is always giving them giving them trouble. So we will have to see. And also, they they do play Kentucky. In Seattle, mm-hmm. They do. That'll be a that'll be a good game. Yeah, that's their ne- that's their next really big game, and then right after the Kentucky game, they got UConn. Oh wow! Yeah, so they do have tests early until they go to conference play. But that but on their non conference schedules, maybe not as up to par as we thought, as it usually is, because you know they got Baylor at the beginning of the year. Baylor, Smack UConn, them. Kentucky. You know, they got Arizona State. I think Arizona State could be a solid team. Um, You know, you got San Diego State, Long Beach State, whatever, West Virginia, whatever. They're going to be dysfunctional this year. But then Kentucky, UConn, and then um, a couple non – and then uh, UCLA on December 28th, and then conference and then conference play starts. So maybe not as tough as it's been in years past. Still not nothing to shake a stick at, but not the brutal non-conference schedule that they usually have every year. You know how – we were doing those pick your college basketball players starting lineup. Mm-hmm. Well, I saw this like last night or the day before. How can I play when my center is redshirted? Okay. Well, that's on you. you All of our room is redshirted. How am I supposed to do that? That is, I'm going to unredshirt him. I'm going to, I'm going to take that red shirt off. Yeah, it's your team. It's a fictional lineup. You can do what you want. And the coach is already messed up, so the Florida coach. Or, yeah. Florida yeah, we ain't, coach. we ain't gonna go into that, but yeah, yeah, he's, he's yeah, in but deep water now. Let me take over. All right, you got to start. He he might be a matchup problem for about. Hire, yeah, hire Ryan for head coach. Yeah. Florida. Anyways, I mean, they, Walter Clayton is very good, so I'll start off with. Coaching Walter Clayton, I'd love to do that. Yeah, there's worse players you could begin your coaching career with. So, yeah, I give you that. Speaking of worse or better players, um, one of the hot trends right now is that the early pre, if the player of the year award was given out tomorrow, I think many believe Ryan Kalkbrenner of Creighton would be the winner there. Do you agree or disagree? I agree with this one. I mean, he showed it with the stats and how many points he's putting up. Obviously, debut. 49 points starting off the season strong that's not even starting off the season strong that's starting off the season like i mean strong as you can be yeah 49 points is absurd in college then he had 24 then he had 16 if you see it it's going down but that's just that's just something i made up ryan cockrenner is really good he would be my player of the year so far but if he he has to continue that through the season. I don't think he'll be the player of the year by the end of the season. But right now, I would say Ryan Cockbrenner is my player of the year. And that is someone that Les forgot to put in his starting lineup. So Yeah, you had to rub it in, didn't you? <laughs> yep. I yep. literally said that on the show. I was like, why the hell did I miss putting Ryan Kalkbrenner in my starting five? But no, he's one of my favorite centers in college basketball. I think one of the more underappreciated centers in college basketball. And I would love to see if Cooper Flagg's not going to win player of the year, I would love to see Ryan Kalkbrenner win it. Um, we're talking about a three-time Big East defensive player of the year. And you look at the last several years, some of the defensive gems that have played through that conference. So it's very impressive. And he's a very slept-on offensive player. Obviously, anyone who could score 49 points doing something right. But, yeah, if Cooper Flagg's – yeah, like he was perfect. Or, no, no, he wasn't. He was 20 of 22, which is still insane, but still. Terrible. Oh, my gosh. He missed two shots. Wow. A whole two shots. You got to clean that up, bud. Ah, right, dude. <laughs> you got to fix it. You got problems. Right? 
Man, I was so ready to talk about Alabama Purdue as being the game of the year, but then Purdue kind of pulled away at the end, made it like a little anticlimactic. But for most of that game, it was good. And since he's not here to defend himself, we got to give Matt a hell of a hard time right now because he was very, very premature when he said that this game sucked because it very, very quickly changed. Jerk Hoffman rendered really well. And whoever, I don't remember his name, but whoever hit three, three uh, threes in a row. CJ Cox. Yeah, and it's, it's really amped up the crowd. And the Purdue crowd is already tough to play against, but when they have stuff like that, where Fletcher Lawyer's hitting a three deep, or uh, hitting a three late in the game, which we've seen that many, many times. Probably it's happened a couple times against Ohio State. Not last year, though, when we beat Purdue in Jake Diebler's debut. I think it was his debut. But, but yeah, it's, a, it's always tough to play at Purdue. And also, it's always tough to play at Wisconsin. Arizona learned that last night. And that and worries me because, you know, we that's our next – is Duke's next big game is at Arizona. And yeah. coming off of that terrible performance and Caleb Love in particular, we know what he likes to do against Duke for whatever reason. And that's what worries me is that he's going to give us like a 50 ball next game. Like, and damn it. Like 63s. In the first half. Just go <laughs> – just start shucking shit out there. <laughs> that's what he does. That's lucky what Michi Johnson does. For Ohio State, but he, he, he can make it sometimes. Caleb Love hits him. I like Michi a lot. He came back to his home. I guess I don't. I don't know if he's from here, but where he originally was. But if Caleb Love is good for any game that season, it's the one against Duke. Let's be honest about it. Yeah, it's gonna happen. We already know it. Just... Tyrese Proctor better bring his A game and lock his ass up. I agree. I agree. We actually flew through that episode pretty quick, and we still got about six minutes to go. So any closing thoughts that we want to talk about of this college hoop season so far? Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm excited for the big games coming up. On, I know Indiana plays today. They play South Carolina. But uh, if we switch over to college football, there's not a lot of games for us to talk about. So, I mean, they're not doing us any favors, but... I am sorry. The episode was supposed to be about basketball only. And then I even promoted that in the Twitter saying nothing but college hoops. And Brian hits us with the curveball and is like, let's talk about football. Gosh, no, darn I promise. I promise. Now you're it's on Bean's bad side. It's Actually, Bean is very indifferent right now. He's basketball. Just... I think I may go to the Bellman Lowell game on Tuesday with my father. Good old Allen. Yeah. You know, we we last two or three years we've been to the Louisville Bellarmine game. We even saw when we lost to Bellarmine and they threw the L's down. That was very disappointing. Well, you that, uh, that was that was like lowest of lows. That that's on y'all, bud. Uh, well, not everyone can be like Duke every year, right? Well, that's your all's problem. That's a you problem, my friend. But whatever, I'm just our Super Bowl is. When Kentucky loses big games and or even bad games. It's our Super Bowl. Super Bowl. I think you're giving up hope a little bit on this Louisville season, a little premature. I think they're gonna be pretty good. They just gotta build some continuity. They'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, I, I agree. And I wanna stay positive. I'm obviously not expecting a lot, but any positive signs will help out Pat Kelsey and the Louisville fan base also. Agreed, agreed. And, of course, I am very, very excited about the rest of this Duke basketball season. And I'm going to be honest, Texas kind of worried me in the first game against Ohio State. But even though they haven't played anybody, just almost threw my mic unintentionally there, even though they haven't played anybody, I think they're cleaning up a lot of the issues that I thought was going to be the same old Texas problems this year. Very stagnant offense, just give it to the hot hand, have them chuck it up. And I was very frustrated with Arthur Kaluma in the Ohio State game because he was just taking contested shot after contested shot. When I saw in the box score that he only missed like six shots that game, I thought that was very generous because it felt like he made he missed more than that in the first half. But overall, I saw a lot better ball moving in our other and our other wins of the season. Um, And of course, Trey Johnson's a bucket, so we'll be good there. Um, Overall, I think also playing a team that shot amazing from three. Yeah, in, in that game. Yeah, we yeah we felt a little pressure to keep up with that. That that's also true. 
might be a problem. Yeah. I mean, everyone was hitting and and I knew about John Mobley and I heard that he was a really good three point shooter, but his first shot was like from the logo. And and then he, he kept shooting. He needs more minutes on our team, honestly. Because even in a crowd like Texas M last night, he I mean, not the toughest place to play, but it's still tough. He he had like three threes made and so he has a really bright future and I think he could be really good. Yeah, and it's a shame Matt wasn't on the podcast today because he'd have his two cents about Indiana. He, But from what we've seen in the group chat, he's not overly impressed with Indiana's team so far. He said he was, he said, and I quote, hold on. no, it was, I'm not going to quote, but he was like, I'm not, not in on Mike Woodson or something like that. He never really was big on Mike Woodson, to be honest. Mike Woodson. I think that was that was in the what was it Northern Illinois? Was it Northern Illinois? No, I think it was Southern Illinois. Well, they were playing on like Sunday, and I did not know that they were even playing until his text. I thought he just randomly sent that, just like on a Sunday waking up. <laughs> no, I'm not in on Mike Woodson. Random thoughts. I I think I figured out the key for Indiana's basketball season going forward is for Matt to be very premature with everything he says. Because after he sent that text, they went on a run and kind of separated themselves in that game. In the second half. So I think that's going to be the key to this college basketball season, is for Matt to be as premature as possible. Because last night he said the Alabama-Purdue game sucked, and then all of a sudden it took off. Um, he's, he said he wasn't sold on Mike Woodson, then, Al- then Indiana goes on a run, blows he's them out of the water. Depressed for teams to do well yeah whatever matt prematurely says just take the opposite so i need matt to make a bunch of predictions on my next parlay and i'm gonna bet the opposite that's true so with about a minute left all i'm gonna say is as always like and subscribe to less is more sports podcast on youtube and spotify be sure to follow our social media pages on facebook twitter and threads that's at less is more sports be sure to follow the side quest on tiktok that's at that's at beans dad 018 and we got about a minute left, so we can end this episode with the patented rambling that we do every. Sh- what do you want? Do you do you not have a Cooper Flag jersey yet? I don't. I have a. This is kind of going. I was about to say, if you have a Cooper Flag jersey before me, I'm about to fight you. Uh, no, I actually have a another Rising Star, Jeremiah Smith jersey. That's I'm where the Indiana game next week. Or no, I dig I, it. Why is it Indiana? Nah, he's a baller. I, I got I got respect for it. That was cool. We having those debates the next couple of years. I feel like you know who's gonna be who's taking the bigger steps. Is it gonna be Jeremiah Smith or Ryan Wingo, who needs to get more involved in the Texas offense going forward? Again, he's. A I was big thinking player. about this.